Welcome to Elixir Mix, your weekly Elixir podcast talking with members of the community. My name is Mark Erickson, and today on our panel, we have Michael Reese. Hello, everybody. Josh Adams. Oi. And Leandro Pierre. I'm massacring that. I'm sorry. Please introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm from Brazil, and I'm a software engineer and a manager at a company called LNA Systems, which is a consultant based here in Brazil. And we do a bunch of cool stuff on Elixir and Kubernetes. And I have been working with Elixir since 2016, and spreading the word about Elixir and helping out people to understand and also work with Elixir. And nowadays I am trying to figure out how to, how to use Elixir and Phoenix Live View uh, on our company. And that's the reason I started collecting some demos of the Phoenix Live View. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. Great. Yes, we wanted to have you on and talk about Live View. Um, and that is it. it. It's a very interesting topic. A lot of people are excited about it. Uh, it's still not a, an official release yet. It's something that people can play with. Um, but I am also interested, like you mentioned that you've been with Elixir for quite some time, 2016, and you've been, and you live in Brazil. And I know that um, Jose Valim is was from Brazil. Now he's living in uh, Krakow, Poland. Uh, but I know there's a seems to be a large community of Elixir developers in Brazil. Is, can you just uh, tell us a little bit about what it's like working there and what kind of environment it is for doing Elixir? Yeah, I believe that's an uh, influence from José Valim because he's from Brazil and, you know, it's, uh, it works for a company, Plataforma Tech, here in Brazil. And it's a very well-known company here in Brazil. So probably you have a large community here because of him. And, well, working uh, with Elixir here, we have some opportunities working here because there are some companies working with Elixir. And, for instance, we will have uh, Elixir Brazil Conference this, this month uh, in Sao Paulo. Uh, where it will be uh, two days, a uh, two days conference. And yeah, you know, um, that's it. Um, Leandro, are there very many meetups, like uh, monthly meetups or things like that, where people get together to discuss maybe Elixir specifically or, or maybe things like web development um, in, an, like in the area that you live in? Uh, in the area I live, Right here, there is no, there is no user group or anything like that. But in Sao Paulo, there is the Elixir user group that is an active community that talks and discusses about Elixir. Awesome, yeah. Um, a few of us live here. Uh, well, Mark and I live close to one another and get to attend a user group, but um, that hasn't always been the case because we also live in a little bit of a smaller area. So there's um, times when there's not a user group. So um, that's, I mean, that's cool to hear about though, that in Sao Paulo, there's a kind of a thriving community of Elixir people. Uh, another thing that I was curious about is, um, as you've started to look into Phoenix Live View, are there types of applications that you're seeing 
for your customers or for your, maybe for your company internally, where you think live view fits very well, or, um, or maybe do you have ideas of where you wouldn't want to use Phoenix live view? I have been seeing some demos that people are building uh, that I'm interested in using here in the company that I work for. Like for example, uh, demos of form validations and for example, uh, there is one demo that is really interesting that is the undo demo that you can place an action, you can um, can cancel that action. And that kind of stuff is really great because uh, you, you don't have to use uh, SPA, a single page application for that kind of stuff. You just use live view for those kind of things. And those kind of things are, they are present in all kind of web applications. That's the kind of thing you do all the time. So if you can use live view, I believe we, you save a lot of time use live view and you get a better performance using that. So I'm curious, like when people, live view has a lot of excitement around it. Why do you think people are so like uh, looking to this as a solution? Why do you think they're so excited? Like what about it? is like what kind of problem is this solving for people that they're feeling pain already currently? Yeah, uh, Chris on his last keynote, he there's a, a slide on his last keynote where he presents uh, where live view fills a gap between the server handler HTML files and SPA applications, single page applications. So single page applications solves a lot of problems. They are great, like React, Vue.js, Angular, Ember. They are really great, but they are also expensive. And right? you need a specific team to work with that technology. You need to think about the CI and CD solutions to build and deploy those solutions. And so they are expensive. And men, in most of the cases, you don't need all of those things of the SPA stuff. You just need something else simple, right? So for example, a component, like we have, uh, there is a demo that I really like, that is a calendar demo, which is a component. It, I like it because it proves how Live View works. It's basically components for your pages, right? And that kind of, that kind of stuff is really great because you can save some time by using live view instead of use something more complex like uh, an SPA application. Yeah, you were mentioning like the SPA, the single page application. I know um, like you shared, like in some of our discussions at, prior to the podcast, you'd shared some articles and things that were influential for you. And one of them in particular, like really stuck out to me and it's just like this, uh, this is from uh, a, a blog uh, from 2015 uh, about JavaScript fatigue. And just the, the, the idea of like, okay, I want to build a service and I want you know, a backend service. I want a responsive front end. And all right, let me get started. I'm going to choose yeah, React, Vue.js. I've got a few, uh, few different options I can choose for like what kind of JavaScript front ends. Uh, Ember, Angular, all these different things. And so, okay, I choose one. I choose, say, Vue.js. And now it's like, all right, well, now I've got a whole bunch of other choices that I'm having to make. And uh, about like the build tools. And some of these are, they're saying, well, you have to use Webpack or you have to use this. And I, this is the testing library or here's Vue CLI. And it's just this huge amount of uh, overhead just to getting started before you even write a line of code of your Vue.js application. And so it's all this build tooling, uh, the whole pipeline of how it's done, the difficulty of testing a front-end JavaScript framework against a back-end service, having to stub things out. There's just so much overhead. And I think that is, is kind of like a pain point for people. Do you, have you seen that? And like, is that something that you see like this is a motivation for people. They just like, I am burned out from all of this JavaScript stuff. Yeah, uh, I have seen articles about this problem, this 
uh, this fatigue from uh, 2015, 16, and so on. Uh, all the time, the people are arguing and discussing how to make things simple, right? And if you are not building the next Spotify or the next Google Docs or something like really needs all those kinds of stuff that the SPI provides, you probably don't need it, right? You, so you can just use Live View. So Live View is another option that you have. We probably, you change the way we design software and the way we think about the web applications. Yeah, I, I actually also really liked, um, we should drop a link here about um, Chris McCord's keynote at Elixir Conf EU. Um, one of the things that he talked about that really rang true for me was even if you were using something like Phoenix, where you have channels, and um, that, that might help you to minimize some of the decision making because you at least have kind of good bi-directional communication with the server out of the box. Um, and that would help you to minimize some of your build tool choices and things like that. But even so, um, uh, one basic example I'm thinking of, I have a little side project about building SVGs in your browser and kind of live rendering them as you change the SVG. And when I built that um, a few years ago with Phoenix and channels, um, I still had a user socket that I had to think about um, and a channel, an SVG channel, and, um, and so there was some logic on the initial page which decided uh, what, what did the UI look like and what was the markup. And, and then separate of that, there was logic in other parts of my app that were about how to respond to things that were happening. And, uh, and so I just had my logic kind of spread out in a few different places. And separating logic can be a great thing in applications sometimes uh, if you want to reuse it, for instance. But I really wished in this case that it wasn't, it wasn't very much logic and I'd really like to have it all in one place. And Phoenix Live View, when I rewrote into Phoenix Live View, I loved that it kept all those decisions in one place. Everything about that user interaction lived in one Live View file. Um, they were all just plain functions. There was nothing magical in there, but just all the decisions were co-located. They were very um, cohesive with one another. And that resulted in a design that, um, that appealed to my design aesthetic. I really liked that for this project. Um, and so I'm really glad to see LiveView, like you were saying, it's, it's another option. It, it doesn't necessarily do all the things that an SPA does. But for some use cases, like live updates from the server, for instance, it's amazing that you can keep all that logic in one place. And, uh, and the, the tool choice becomes very simple. Yeah, exactly, because um, you have just one file, one live view file, and it's also important to say that I see that some people don't like putting the template, putting the template inside the live view file, just like you do with React components, but on live view, you can create a separate template file and render that separate file. and. That's a way to, to organize your code as well if you don't like putting everything in just one file. And about the line of codes, the, the number of line codes, that's an excite, a common excitement that people are experimenting with live view. Everyone that, that creates some demo or creates some experiment with live view actually be amazed how how less code you need to do the same thing, right? Uh, and there is uh, an article, uh, which is the Swing Swapping React for Phoenix Live View. It's a really great article. Uh, we can leave on the show notes. Uh, that article is really great because uh, they get a real app and that is built with React and they replace React for the live view. And they talk about how, what the problems they have and also how it was to build the same feature with live view. And that version with live view is actually online with real data if you want to try out. So 
you'd mentioned that you were doing this search for different demo projects as a way of kind of exploring what people are doing and figuring out, is this a good fit for my business? Um, is there a place where you think is a good place to go where other people could look at existing demo projects to help kind of like find something that might be a good example for them? Yeah, there are, there are two places that people, people can go. Uh, the first one is the article that I have the collection of live view demos. Uh, another place is the Elixir forum. Uh, people are talking about live view. You can go there and search for the hashtag live view. And there are some talks there that people are um, posting tutorials and demos that they are building. So the Elixir forum is a great resource, a great source of uh, knowledge about live view. Yeah, I noticed that like you'd uh, like we'll drop a, a link to it in the show notes where there's a you can search on Elixir forum by tag uh, and the tag of live view brings up a lot of things where there, there are questions, but there's also like one here where I see you've been part uh, a part of this thread, which is live view demos, examples and sample apps where people are just sharing and talking about that. So I'm going to drop those in the show notes as well. So people can uh, have a place to kind of go and look at. Uh, where some of the communities gathering around that topic. One other area that I think we should touch on is um, some of the prior art that uh, LiveView builds on top of. Um, and so we already mentioned Phoenix channels, which uh, I, I, obviously a lot of work went into those over the years. And that's the abstraction that um, is built on top of to achieve LiveView. Um, but I'm also aware of a project called Drab. Um, I think there was actually a presentation at Elixir Conf last year from the creative drab. Um, and it had a very similar um, purpose, the, the idea of server rendering and pushing updates, kind of re-rendering automatically as data was changing um, was, was very much uh, a goal there. Um, Leandro, are you very familiar with the history of drab and how it contributes to live view? Um, yeah, actually I never used drab myself, but I have been researching drab for quite time and drab does a lot more than live view right it's a broader project and but there is a module inside drab which is the drab live that does is kind of the same thing as live view which with a different implementation and there is also a talk on elixir forum where the creator of drab discuss uh, along with Joseph Valin and other guys there. And so if people want to know more about the history of Dread, I recommend them to go there to the Elixir forum and there's a discussion there. Yeah, I'm, I'm part of a, an online meetup group um, for NERVS and actually a few of us had tried to write um, projects using Drab, uh, Drab.live specifically. And uh, we all had good experiences with it. Um, we all were also excited to see live view because we knew it would attract a bigger community of people. And like you've said, it's, it's been really exciting to see after live view was, um, was made available, uh, you know, not, not released on hex PM yet, but uh, available for anyone to try just the explosion of people trying different things and, and creating different demos and games built on live view all sorts of different ideas. Um, I actually just the other day in a project was thinking about doing, uh, I have like a file upload process. And um, one thing that we've always wanted to do is kind of give uh, an indication of how the work is progressing in the background back to the user who uploaded that file. And that's been really tricky to do in a Rails app in a, in a way that doesn't feel too, um, too hacky or, or too clobbered together. And so I was looking at doing it with live view and I found an issue where people are already talking about how to handle file uploads with live view and, and maybe we should chunk it up and um, all sorts of different ideas. It just, it feels like it's a very excited community right now. And so I'm really, I'm enthusiastic for that sense of community and the fact that we're kind of leveraging the Elixir and Phoenix community to come and, and work on this problem. Whereas um, I think Drab had, was having a hard time gaining adoption. And, um, and even though it is a really solid implementation of that idea, 
uh, it just didn't have quite as many people experimenting and trying new ideas and um, contributing to the project. And sometimes visibility is a feature on its own. Um, I think it's interesting that when a, a project gets visibility and excitement around it, and I think part of it is, is that it's, it is perceived to be part of the standard library. It is something that's going to be official. Uh, but even doing a pre-release that way is interesting because like you're talking about, Michael, like with this uh, file upload support, like getting some of those things kind of solved before it goes official release. You know, that, that's awesome. It just makes it a stronger offering. So I, I, I just kind of think about the idea of official libraries being pre-released more often perhaps. Because I know like for myself, uh, having come from a Rails background, um, where you have libraries like Haml and SAS, which are not like official, but they're used a lot. And, and when they're not official, it's like I, I've been burned by, you know, using a library for something that I, I become dependent on. I have a lot of view templates built in and then it's getting, you know, there, it, it becomes part of a problem in the build pipeline or something. And it's pre preventing me from upgrading to security fixes or whatever. So I think that may have been a contributing thing with drab, just like it's not official. So people are hesitant to in, embrace it because it has such an, a, a deep impact on their project. I don't know. What do you guys yeah, think? That, that's, that's a really good point and probably just explains it almost entirely. Cause like, if you know that it's a thing that's going to be part of this, like the substructure from now on, then it's worth learning. And if it's just something that seems really cool, but no one's really tested, you know, it's just something that seems cool, but maybe not a thing you're planning to build a thing on. I was also just thinking like, uh, for me, so I haven't used live view yet at all. I've read articles and like played very subtly, but nothing. And, uh, it it strikes me that like the place I would find this the most useful is in admins because almost everything that I'm working on now has some GraphQL thing anyway. And so I've already got subscriptions and that's how I do my real time stuff for clients and I have a mobile view. So, I'm not going to not have GraphQL, but the admins, like I'm always finding that I kind of want to, I end up shunting in some little GraphQL component that's talking to a special GraphQL API. And really all I want to do is show like, Hey, this thing updated, man. <laughs> so it seems like live, you would be really useful in that case because I, I definitely feel like that part of admins tends to be over-engineered. Yeah. I've had a lot of projects over the years. Um, I, I was just reflecting on this the other day of how many times my project requirements just look like we want you to show the current state of the world. And there's maybe a team of people who are collaborating on something and we want everyone to be able to see the updates live that other people are making. Uh, and so that general description has, I mean, probably, I haven't even worked at a consultancy. So this is just in-house product work at several different companies but even so, there's a lot of projects that end up fitting that rough description. And I think Live View fits that description so nicely because you have this really minimal JavaScript footprint and almost all the work is done by your team, your same backend team, using the, the templating language that you're already using, using the data structures that you're already using. Um, you, know, you don't have to think about things like, oh, how am I going to convert dates to a string format when they go across GraphQL, but still give them the right types. And you know, there's, there's just little things like that that are great to ignore if you can. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, and we, we talked about templating uh, a fair bit there. And um, so I know Visual, uh, Visual Studio Code, VS Code, has become a very popular, one of the more popular um, editors that people use for code editing, and it's cross-platform. And um, I know, uh, like when I open up a, a template that has like using the sigil uh, E for uh, embedded uh, live view templates, there, there isn't any syntax highlighting yet. But I think you were talking about something, Leandro, uh, where that might be changing. Is there something you can share with us? Yeah, uh, there are two pull requests on the VS Code uh, Elixir LS plugin. Uh, one of the pull requests are from from me. Uh, I've sent it. Uh, my pull request adds support for uh, file extensions for the LiveX extension, and there is another pull request. Pull request from uh, let me get his name, Robert Richardson, and 
the Robert Richard pull request add support for sigils. So if you have a sigil with a lot of with a huge string, uh, you get syntax highlight of that string of the, the code. Uh, I don't know about other editors. Uh, right now I'm using VS Code. I used to be a Emacs user, but right now I'm using VS Code. But I know that Emacs is still using Elixir LS project as well. So I believe other editors, you get the same features as VS Code. Yeah, that's really cool. Because uh, when, when you open up a text file and you don't have syntax highlighting, you really begin to feel the pain of it. It's like I become, you become so dependent on the coloring and maybe bolding or you know, whatever kind of treatment your editor gives it to just help you process the data faster mentally. Well, also the knowledge that your editor actually understands the code. So when I say, hey, reformat this, it knows, oh, I should follow the JavaScript rules or whatever. Good point. And just uh, a point about the previous talk about the support on Live View. It's important to say that Live View will be a, a separate library. It won't be in the core of the Phoenix. Right, so you can still use Dreb or any other libraries as you wish, and Live View will be uh, a separate library. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. Um, I I've appreciated the decision making that went in along this process to say, you know, uh, the the core Elixir team uh, has has kind of said, hey, there's probably not huge new features coming to Elixir very soon. Um, and similarly, Chris McCord has said about Phoenix, hey. We think the framework is mostly in a good spot and we might extract a few things, um, you know, like the FireNest project is maybe extracting a few uh, things to make some of the distributed systems tooling more available outside of Phoenix, but that Phoenix itself is probably pretty stable. And I think it's a great decision to make Phoenix Live View a separate library. Um, but it, it does still, you know, because it comes from that same core team of people, it engenders uh, trust and confidence, um, like we were talking about earlier. It's a it's a good uh, it's a good middle of the road decision, I think, for them to release it separately but have it maintained by the Phoenix core team. Uh, yeah, uh, and I think that's the concept of the community because Elixir, uh, Joseph Valin said that before Elixir has the goal of being simple and just the core, and people can build things on top of Elixir. And I believe Phoenix has the same concept, right? You can, you have that core that is stable, you can use, and there are all those other libraries that you can put inside uh, Live View to, to be used, even those of, official libraries. So one of the other uh, topics I want to mention and kind of bring up and let you have, have a chance to comment on is one of the other benefits of Live View that uh, people are, I don't know if it's, like that headline feature that people talk about it because it's not a whiz bang thing, but it is the idea that I am avoiding the duplication of code. Because when you have these single page apps, there you are, you do end up to some degree splitting out some or re-implementing some of your logic because you want the front end to be responsive and do the right thing. But really the back end still has to be the single source of truth and enforce whatever data changes the front end is sending. So you implement the, the logic in both places. I was wondering if you could just talk about how that's different when we're talking about Live View. Uh, I think the, the most common example is form validations, right? Uh, you have validations on the front end side. So you have to you have a rich user interface with validations and that's great, but you also need to write the same validations on the back end side for security reasons. So you end up with duplicate code and in those cases. And Live View, I believe Live View, you solve that problem because Live View lies in the backend side together with your Elixir code. So you can have just one validation, just in one place. That is a really big benefit, I think. Um, just for me personally, not having to keep like uh, two separate projects oftentimes in different uh, code bases even because maybe there's different teams, not having to try and keep those in sync 
I really appreciate that. I think another great example of that is models. Uh, I've seen a lot of um, front end projects that over time they end up creating a file which which represents some model, um, which is also represented in the back end. And people do that for things like having default values or or things like that. And it's another one of these places where similar to validations, you you kind of you know, the, eventually the product requirements will change. You need to change something about that model or about that validation. And now you have to worry about the front end and the back end agreeing on the correct definition for those things. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's uh, validation is a perfect example, um, but it also goes beyond that to, to lots of use cases where you duplicate names, you duplicate things, ideas like routes um, in both the front end and the back end oftentimes. Also, just general deployment, like, uh, you know, once you have a client and a server, your server has to support all the clients out in the field, so you're constrained, um, whereas if your client is just live view, then that's not the case, right? You update your app, and you don't have to do coordination between teams or deprecation for APIs, um, so that seems like a big positive for rapid prototyping, for sure. Yeah, and because there's uh, sockets uh, connecting the client to the server, the redeployment of the server breaks that connection. And so when they, when they, the, you know, there's JavaScript on the, on the browser side that reconnects the client and then it will automatically repull and be updated. So you don't even have to worry about like, well, their, their front end display is not up to date until they refresh the page because that's been changed out by the back end. You know, so like that's, it, it is, deployment can be a really big headache, something that people I think underestimate how much time and effort they have to put into that. Yeah, that, that system of making our, uh, our client update itself like is a whole bit of code that we just don't have to write in that case. Because that's usually a little complicated component if you add it to your project. This episode is brought to you by TripleByte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume. You spend hours and hours on the phone screens and take home projects. And that's assuming the company even responds to your application. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them. And if you do well, you go straight to final interviews with the company on their platform. It's like the common app for software developers. TripleByte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. I've helped dozens of software developers with various credentials get jobs. And this looks like a terrific way for you to get in and get interviewed and get a job without a lot of the hassle and overhead. You can go check them out at triplebyte.com slash elixir. That's triplebyte.com, byte as in eight bits. As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through Triplebyte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. This, this is a, actually an open question I had coming into today's conversation is um, in the past, whenever I've seen projects that try to uh, connect your front end code and your back end code very closely and think of those as kind of one deployment, I, I often see that people haven't answered the question of, let, let's say I, I open the page, um, it's rendered a certain way, and by the time I go to connect the WebSocket to connect to my live view process, there's actually been a hot code upgrade. Maybe it was in progress and I connected to a node that has the new version of the code. Does anyone know of, um, of how that gets handled by people using live view? Uh, I really don't know if people are actually doing that right now because I haven't seen uh, any deployment, live view deployment on production or a large scale application or something like that. And I believe that's something that people are still figuring out how to do. And on the Elixir forum as, as well, you have a lot of questions there and some bugs and questions that people are still trying to understand how to to do and so i i don't have a, a answer actual uh, actual answer for that yeah i don't know the answer to that yet either i have some theories that i think but i haven't tried them out and i think those types of behaviors are the things we will see they're those edge cases that as more people deploy and as more people just by the scale and the, the actual size of the deployments the numbers will find what those pain points or those little niggly points are. Uh, But yeah, I don't know. There's some, I guess there are a lot of questions yet to to still kind of iron out. Yeah. And on the other hand, there is one thing that's 
that's very nice from from my view if you think about it for let me give an example let's say you have a background process and that process is displaying results and the progress and some log about the progress for the end user on the client side and let's say the user needs to close the browser or do something else that process is stateful right you you keep the state on the back end on the server and the, the client the, the user can come back sometime later and the process will be there that's something that live view does very great and it's one of the benefits of using live view we still have some things to figure out like deployment but you know uh, as soon as that is resolved i believe you have a lot of uh, good things to to do with live view yeah i hadn't thought about that before um so the the process uh, if my web socket becomes disconnected maybe i close the the screen on my laptop or something um and then later i, I open it when i resume i can get back to that same process you're saying leandro uh, yeah, if you keep the state on the server, because uh, live view you have it's basically a chain server running on the on the server, so the state is there, right? The state you have a stateful process, so you can get back that process and resume from where you left off. That's awesome. Uh, I'm sure that there must be some tunable parameters in there so that you don't leave things running forever. But um, that's actually a really cool feature to to provide for people. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure if that's true though, but I'm not the expert here. So I, I but I, I kind of was under the impression that the gen server that's managing that state is tied to the socket. And when I lose my connection, the socket goes away. So it's just like a linked process. It's going to go away uh, because I might connect up and through a load balancer be directed to a different instance, a different server. And it's not going to be, you know, trying to connect me back to the original process that was on the other machine you know, through the through a cluster or anything. So I'm not sure, but uh, that is one well, of those if, things. Go if ahead. that's the case, you could still easily enough use Swarm or something to mm -hmm. uh, actually do that, right? Just actually look, look up the process you're trying to talk to. Yep. I and, feel like that's not a big concern. Right. I, I, I also I, I agree. I, um, I don't think it's a big, it's a, not a sticking point at all. Uh, because if there is data or state that is important and you want them to be able to persist and rejoin, you have that ability. We have the ability to make sure that happens, um, whether or not uh, it actually provides us that for us out of the box. Yeah, yeah. you need to ha you need to handle the connection, but you can you lose the connection of the socks, right? But you can handle that kind of reconnecting to the previous process, right? Because the process will be there on the on the beam. Yeah, that makes sense. If you have a supervised process that's actually running that background work, that will still be running regardless of whether things got, whether the WebSocket is still active. And if someone even joins with a new gen server, they could still find and continue. Um, they could see the process state. Y you could choose to share the process state of the thing that is running in the background supervised elsewhere um, back to that client again. Yeah, that's what I'd assume we were talking about broadly as what you can do now but if it's something else i'd like to know no that's that's exactly that so i think one of the things that uh, is worth kind of talking about is some of the magic that happens on the browser end because as chris mccord mentions in his live view presentation that there this is not a javascript free technology like there is not no javascript here uh i think the benefit is though that i as the developer don't have to write any of the javascript but there is some JavaScript involved. Is there something you can, can you kind of tell us, give an idea of where that's at and what kind of features it's providing? Uh, yeah, that's important to say because uh, some people are saying that using Live View, there is no JavaScript, but that's not true. There is a JavaScript behind it, right? Um, so you still can use JavaScript and there is JavaScript there. You just need but for a developer, you don't need to write JavaScript if you are using Live View because it handles for you. So there is there is one library called Morph Done that does the diff computing. So uh, you have the Live Engine on the server side 
that is taking taking care of the the difference and render the HTML and the morph done does the hard work of update the the HTML on the client side. Um, and there is one demo that it's really interesting about this, uh, which is the S Fishy demo uh, that is on the collection. On that demo, you can see the uh, an SVG animation, and on the right side you can see the HTML being updated each second. So as the SVG animation goes, you can see all the report values and the DOM being updated, and just those tiny bits of the HTML being updated, and that's the the key of the live view of the whole thing. I I uh was going to have a pick um, to share like the, the talk that you're mentioning is the Elixir Conf EU talk where Chris McCord is giving more details about live view. And he really does a good job of showing morph DOM in use uh, just how it's like these, these tiny little diffs that the Phoenix channel is able to send down and just saying, Hey, this ID needs to have this class added, but it's really a terse uh, small, message that's being sent and and how morph dom on the client side is actually applying that and making it a very fast change uh, so i really do want to make sure people are aware of that talk because if they haven't seen this uh chris mccord's presentation they really should um, i think it helps people really get a good idea of what's possible and uh, some of the technology behind it and how it's put together so I'll, we'll make sure we'll have uh, uh, a link to that in the show notes. But yeah, so like, so if someone has, just to kind of reiterate and kind of close up that point, if somebody does have JavaScript disabled in their browser, a live view web page will not be live. What is nice though, is like that it will still work. <laughs> it will be a server rendered page, but it won't have any live connection, live updates. So I think that's a pretty, pretty reasonable, you know, uh, fallback. Uh, you know, if, if I have a uh, React or Vue.js front end and someone has JavaScript turned off, they see a white page of nothing or something. Or, or they see something, but it uh, is associated with hundreds of hours of effort getting server-side rendering actually working like you want with all the routes that you care about. <laughs> so true. That is so much work to add on after the fact for a for a single page application. Having having uh, lived through that nightmare once already in my life, I hope to never do it again. Yeah, it's actually a really really awful thing in my experience because it's much more it's much better to add it early on, but it's actually so complex that you can't really justify adding it early on for a small project. So like you're you're just Baked, you've got baked in technical debt basically anytime you're going to add it after the fact, and you're probably always going to add it after the fact. So, um, Leandro, one other area I was hoping to ask you about is um, going along with Morph DOM. I know that there was some optimizations that happened in the back end of, of the way that templates are rendered in Phoenix in order to make them efficient at sending down just the diff needed to the client. Can you, can you share a little bit about what, um, like how that changed in, in this new live EEX uh, template language? Uh, that's a new, <clears throat> a new library that was integrated into Phoenix, which is the live engine. It is, um, it's based on EX engine, but with support for live updates for the real time stuff. And it was written by Jose Valin, and it was written from from scratch to support these kind of features. So there are all kinds of optimizations on that engine, on that live engine to render uh, HTML on the server side. I'm curious. I just uh, have a question. I have a question for everybody, from Michael and Josh, everyone. Just are there any? live view projects that you're currently thinking about or exploring just like, Hmm, is it appropriate for this? And like, is that something that you would be willing to deploy into production and be, you know, kind of committed to at least for some period of time? 
I would I would almost guarantee that in the next two months I use it on an admin somewhere. Um, I think it's it's an easy, obvious win for me in that use case. Um, I probably will use it on this little Raspberry Pi control center application, but like that doesn't really count for production deployment. And that's the nice thing about admin too, is like it's an untested technology for me at scale. So using it in an admin, like I know that I'm not going to have too many users using this thing, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's, yeah, I don't know. It's a nice, safe, easy route. But yeah, I'll probably use it on a little little personal project, but that's no that's no use for deployment consideration questions. And does does the fact that it's not yet officially released weigh into that decision? You're like, oh, I think I'll wait a little bit. Is that part of the decision process? Well, no, I jump into new technology way too easily. So no, <laughs> that, that, that actually never factors in. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, I think, yes, yeah, similarly, um, we're, we actually have plans to roll it out in an admin UI on at my company pretty soon. Um, very similarly, it, it's easy to, to skip some of the considerations of stability and upgradability and things like that when, you know, that'd be fine. If, if I have to upgrade for a security risk, for instance, it's fine if I actually break this part of the UI um, because it's only for internal users. So um, I think those kinds of projects are a great fit for something like this when it's still this early. Um, we actually did one kind of internal demo at my company where, where we took one of our common UI patterns, re-implemented it in LiveView, and um, we were measuring performance because we currently have a React app, and there was some discussion of, you know, it is all this diffing and like trying to minimize data over the wire, does it actually do anything? When we actually got it all up and running, we found that um, initial page load was about one second faster and um, that uh, re-rendering as people were doing like a type ahead search was a few hundred milliseconds faster on average. And so, um, so that's, that, I mean, all of those optimizations that people have done in the live engine and morphed on, they really do actually pay off in a significant uh, performance for the user. But we, we did decide after going through all that, we did decide, uh, I don't know that it's what we want to do here. We do have a team of front end specialists that are very good at react. Um, and we, we've already started to invest in that way. And so we said, let's not try to make the front end people come learn the back end technology. We'll just do kind of new projects that don't need that full power of the front end team. Those ones are what we'll slide into live view. Yeah, we, we have a client project here in the company that processes a huge amount of data and we are using Flow, the Flow library to do that. And we are planning to, to create a dashboard for those data because uh, as soon as the event occurs on in this system, we, we make some process on the background and a dashboard would be a, a nice fit for, for live view because you receive a lot of data from external system and can provide a real-time dashboard. And there is also, we are not doing this here in the company, but there's also some demos that I really like much, which are demos that integrates Nervous with, with live view. And, and that's really great because let's say you have a sensor uh, capturing some data and live view can provide re- the real time feedback for for the user right so those demos are i believe you you have you have more demos on the nerve side with live view that's my personal project is a nerves dashboard yeah i think it's it's really interesting um it's just the the idea of i, I think dashboards are a great place for something like this, uh, because you want the live or close to live. It doesn't have to be actual live. You know, it could be snapshots every five seconds, every one second, whatever. Uh, but just having that kind of real time feedback, but that the ability to create that dashboard is some, so much simpler because <laughs> yeah. you know, like there's things like Grafana, uh, that can do dashboards which are, you know, it's a whole project unto itself. It's quite heavy, but it's, it's a great project. I use it. Um, it gets dashboards because it's able to uh, talk with lots of different data sources. But I, I think of just like, well, I just need some, some real time kind of display of what's going on and maybe the ability to drill in a little bit 
And it's for my particular domain, it's not a generic, uh, like a chart, like, like, uh, like Grafana is really good at, at handling, you know, just chart data. It's like, well, this is actually maybe my list of data. And I have like 200 items in this list and this list is changing. And I have maybe another list with like 20,000 things in it. And I want a snapshot of what's going on with them. Maybe not every single line item, but a summarized kind of aggregated view. You know, things like that. I think it's a great way to, to really start getting a lot of leverage without having the whole team. Because that was one of the things that I think Michael made a really good point on was like, we already have a front end team in a lot of cases. Now, maybe for newer companies, newer projects, that may not be the case. And you might say, hey, live view is what we're going to do from the beginning. Um, that may be the case. Yeah. But uh, I think there are cases where you have this we already have a team. We are, they're already very good at what they do. And if someone can own the front end, like they can own the build tooling and the pipelines for JavaScript, and that's what they're good at, then I'm totally okay with someone owning that. It's just when, when it like comes down to me and it's a small team and I have to own it, then I'm like, wow, what can I do to get rid of this? This extra SPA you know, work that I have to maintain. Okay, so now I want to see somebody that takes just a basic, you know, $20 license free HTML dashboard template and wires it up to live view just like with real basic stuff. That'd be a, that'd be a fun repo. Mm -hmm. A very beginner, like a, a very expert focused Squarespace. <laughs> or just, even just like live view uh, dashboard starter kit. Yeah, because one of the things I think is interesting is you know, everyone's building something, uh, their, their business application is, you know, it's not like most people aren't building the blog that is the generic blog for everybody, anybody, you know, what we're building is pretty focused. It has an audience and it has what they care about. And those are the things we want to show and uh, get business intelligence out of and, and data out of. And, and so, yeah, it's like being able to say, um, I can view how many active currently connected users I have and then drill into them and get some information about like what kind of activities they're doing, what parts of the site are, are active. There are lots of different things can do that. There are other tools that we can bring into a project to do that. But yeah, like can live you do that? That sounds pretty cool. Uh, about the performance of dashboards or if you're concerned about receiving a huge amount of data on live view, be it from IoT devices or for from end users connect to your service or something like that. There's a demo uh, which is re rendering 200, over 200 rows in the same page. And you can see there on Twitter. And it's an insane demo. It's pretty cool because it shows how performant live view can be. And how many rows is it? Over 200 rows. Another project, um, I think actually this one was mentioned in Chris's talk as well. Um, there's someone who implemented the Observer UI uh, as a web page <laughs> on Live View. And so it's actually getting all sorts of different data points about the VM, resource usage, and even a bunch of the processes that are currently running in your VM. Uh, it's quite a bit of data. And uh, if you look at it um, and try running it locally, uh, you, it can do a lot before you notice um, any sort of latency or uh, performance issues. Yeah, that's the Observer Live demo. It's on the collection as well. See, that'd be a fun thing to deploy in production. Just deploy that behind, you know, as a, as a plug behind admin, and have a look see. <laughs> well, I think. Yeah. I think this might be a good place to stop. Is there anything else we want to make sure we mention before we uh, go to picks? Uh, yeah, I'd like to talk a bit more about the JS word uh, and just to make sure that live view is not, uh, let's say, a end to JavaScript. It's not like that. Uh, live view works together. We can work together with uh, JavaScript, right? Uh, so live view is more uh, to fill a gap between server handler HTML or static HTML and SPA, right? Uh, so that's a, a gap between those solutions and live view is between them. That's the purpose of 
live view, right? So you avoid the complex, uh, all the expensive solutions, the SPA solutions, and live view is to is to be used like a alternative, like an option for the SPA and not to avoid JavaScript. Right. That's a good point. People need to keep the perspective of really where uh, Chris McCord, when he was presenting it, where he was positioning this, of this is not a replacement for all JavaScript. It, is, it kind of fills a sweet spot kind of in the middle of richer applications, a little more real-time information, but not yet. It's, it, there are certainly cases where a full front-end JavaScript is the only way you're going to solve that problem. And so I think people just need to remember that. So yeah, well, thank you. Uh, let's, uh, let's break here and like, uh, let's switch to picks. Michael Reese, do you have something you can tell us about? Sure do. I got two, uh, two picks today. The first one is a small one. A friend of mine made a site called dudewheresmydesk.live. I'll drop a link to that. And uh, he, he has a little nerves project that is connected to his desk and it reads the current height of his like standing sitting desk, desk um, and then publishes it. And uh, you can go check out how high, how many inches he has raised the desk right now. And some of us use that to occasionally harass him and say that he's been sitting down for too long. So um, <laughs> that's a, an egregious side project uh, using Live View, which I thought was really fun and a very great name. Uh, and secondly, I wanted to pick um, the book Designing Elixir Systems with OTP. A big shout out to James Edward Gray II and Bruce Tate. Um, this is a, a book that's in beta right now. Um, and uh, I, I just am I'm super excited about it. Both Bruce and James have had pretty big impacts on my career personally. Uh, they've both put out really amazing content, great conference talks. They both do an amazing amount of work to, to make the Elixir community awesome for so many people and make it welcoming. Uh, I just, I could not, um, you know, I guess this pick is maybe a little bit more for the humans involved and slightly less for the book itself, but I'm also really excited for the book. So um, just, those are my picks. Uh, love those people and uh, wish them all the very best. Awesome. Josh, do you have something? I'm going to pick uh, two things. One is a thing that I have not played with but want to, which is, uh, I, don't, I don't think I've mentioned this before, but it's called Realm. It's, uh, it calls itself an idiomatic GTK-based GUI library inspired by Elm written in Rust. So that's fun for, uh, for desktop app thoughts. Um, so that's neat. The other thing is home warranties, which uh, <laughs> shout out to home warranties because um, I know that it can't be the case for everyone that they're a, a positive, but I have probably cost them $3,000 on $500 home warranty charge two years in a row now. And I only mention it because they're presently replacing a thousand dollar water heater Nice. That, that blew up. That's cool. I'm glad you were able to benefit. Um, I was going to share, uh, so one I was going to pick uh, was the Elixir Comp video of, you, of Chris McCord. Um, one of the things I liked about what he was making a point of is where Live View is not appropriate. And he mentioned three specific things. Like if you have zero latency needs, where like in a JavaScript front end, like where you have an optimistic change versus a pessimistic change. It's so like if I have to click something and wait for the server to do some work and then return before it like shows that it's completed its work. That's like pessimistic where I'm waiting for the server to tell me it was done. An optimistic thing says, I'm going to click the button to say, delete this and I'm going to remove it from the UI before I've even told the server to make it go away. And so if you have those situations where you need zero latency, then live view may not be the right choice. Uh, if you have to have offline capabilities, Meaning, uh, like if you if you know you're going to be in a situation where there's intermittent connection loss, then Live View may not be the right choice. And if you really need like the desktop like UIs, uh, where he talks about like Google Docs and things like that, then that then you may need an SPA. So I'm um, just mentioning that uh, that talk for people to review and check it out. And then the other one I just want to mention is we talked about it several times here today was Elixir Forum. And it's elixirforum.com. I really think it's a great resource. When I have uh, asked a question on Slack or I've asked a question on Elixir Forum, 
the Elixir Forum one almost always wins out in terms of someone knowledgeable is helping and answering a question. And I, it's nothing against the Slack, but you know, when you have so many people in a Slack channel and there's constant discussion, your, your question is going to flow right off the top and people are just never going to see it. So Elixir Forum is a great way if you're looking for help, uh, feedback on something, uh, that is, that's where I'd recommend you go and point you to. So that's it for me. Leandro, do you have anything? Yeah, I have one pick for today, but it's actually the same pick as Michael, which is the book Design Elixir Systems with OTP. And just want to add that this book is similar to the Functional Web Development with Elixir, which is another book. It's similar, but I think it goes deeper in some concepts and it provides a different way of organizing our code. And it's a really great book because it provides some questions, uh, some answers from your common questions, like how can I organize this code? How can I uh, provide a loose coupon, a uh, loose coupon architecture? And so it's a really great book. And I think they are writing some something about live view as well they you they you release pretty soon very cool well leandro it was a pleasure talking with you today if people would like to follow you online or get in touch with you how should they do that uh can go to my website leandrocp.com.br or look me or search for leandro seschini on twitter uh, but i think it's easier to go to my website, the link will be there, leandrocp.com.br. Awesome. All right. Well, that's it for today. We hope you'll join us next week on Elixir Mix. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more.